Uh, tonight, we have Prophecy Update, uh, the first Friday. Uh, I love doing this. First Friday, we get to get into the scriptures. I go normally, if you're just joining us for the Prophecy Update, I normally go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, right through the scriptures on Sundays and Wednesdays, and that's what we do. But, you know, the days we're living are uh, really interesting days, and the Bible says that we're to be watching and waiting and ready, and, and I think it's good for us to take a little time on the first Friday of each month and, and consider uh, the scriptures and what, what's going on around the world. So, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because this is the 4th of July weekend, and things are quite dubious for this celebration. You know, the president is talking about, you know, doing his festivities at the, you know, beautiful Mount Rushmore, but swirling with controversy because, um, you know, the, the problem of slave ownership uh, of some of the guys on the, on the rock wall, you know, and, and um, people are upset. And then not only that, um, people are upset because social distancing trumps not, you know, making people do masks and he's not doing the social distancing requirements. And so people are freaking out. Uh, and meanwhile, the rest of America is, well, what do we do? Can we have a barbecue? Can we go on the lake? Can we, you know, have fun or do we, quarantine under surveillance of the government and be tracked as we are sick. And people are just kind of, wow, these are crazy days. Um, now, I've noticed over the years different attitudes by the Christian church. And being a Christian for a long time, talking about the, the rapture of the church and the second coming of Christ and all these things um, for much of my life, um, I've noticed that we've gone through phases. And, and one is, you know, when things are really good, a lot of times people don't want to talk about Bible prophecy because, well, it's kind of scary. And they, they don't want to talk about the rapture and the end and God's wrath and judgment. And so people sort of, the church tends to tuck it away and say, well, we're just not going to talk about that. But I have noticed when things get a little crazy, people are like, no, no what's the Bible say again? What's, what's going on? And people are intrigued right now, again, by Bible prophecy. And um, I think it's interesting. I like, I like that we're a church that continually studies the scripture. And we've been talking about Bible prophecy, good, bad, and ugly uh, for a long, long time. And uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, but one of the things before we even dive into some of this is just to remember that, you know, this isn't meant to bring, you know, fear and trepidation to God's people. It is, however, meant to bring fear and trepidation to unbelievers and to, to see what's going on around the world. And, and this is, in some ways, it seems, the Lord's um, last ditch effort to wake up a nation, to wake up people and say, man, are you ready for the rapture? Are you ready for the, the church to be taken up to be with the Lord? And if you're not ready for that, you, you, are you ready for the, 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 the tribulation period, seven years where God pours out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. And you think 2020's, you know, tough. Uh, this is child's play compared to what the book of Revelation, chapter six through 19 tells us. Man, God's gonna pour out his wrath upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. Now people say, well, if God is love, he won't send people to hell. People will just miss the whole thing. Uh, we need to be given to the gospel. And the gospel is this, everybody deserves hell. The Bible says, all have sinned, all have fallen short. No one is righteous, not even one. But the gift of God, free gift, is through Jesus Christ, salvation, forgiveness of sin. And what's required is so simple, it's profound, that you and I are required to believe and accept. The, the, the scriptures say in Romans 10, 9 and 11, it says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus Christ, that God raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. That is to believe you're a sinner, know you need forgiveness, so you believe that the cross that Jesus died on satisfied the penalty substitutionarily for you. And that's what the gospel really is, that you're a sinner saved by grace through faith. And as you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Christ, you're saved. And you are not appointed under wrath. The wrath that's gonna be poured out in this world, you're, you're gonna miss that appointment. Uh, that's what it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter five. We are not appointed unto wrath, but to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. So when we talk about Bible prophecy, it's really not a scary thing, or at least it shouldn't be. And if you're a Christian and you hear some of the things that we talk about and you get freaked out, this is where you have to say, this is where my faith meets the road. Am I gonna believe that God's gonna take care of me through these difficult times? and that we have heaven to look forward to. You know, things might get bad for us 
here and now, even before the tribulation period, things could get really ugly and probably will, probably get worse. Um, that's one of the differences, by the way, some of the church doesn't believe we'll go through the tribulation and some people believe that there is no tribulation, no millennial kingdom, and there's disagreement. It's an in-house debate within the church. But um, if you're one of those people that are millennialist or a preterist, you have to believe that things are getting better. Uh, I've heard pastors even in the past year or two try to give sermons on things are really so much better right now. Um, but the congregations are kind of like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> it doesn't feel better. Um, things are not looking good. And, and by the way, the optics of what's going on in the world right now fit perfectly the pre-trib rapture view. Uh, that is an eminent return of Christ in the clouds that we meet him there in the air to be raptured, taken up to be them. Seven year honeymoon in heaven with the Lord while seven years of tribulation there uh, here on the earth where God pours out his wrath. And then after that, Christ returns. That'll, that's the second coming of Christ. And he comes with 10,000s of his saints, that's us. And then he rules and reigns for a thousand years on this earth where everything's gonna be made right. And that's the program. Uh, and, and the narrative that we're seeing today around the world and in the Middle East and in all the nations that are mentioned in the Bible, man, the, the stage is set, the puzzle pieces are in place. And uh, I really believe we're living in the last days. I really do. It feels like it, seems like it. Well, Brett, what if we're not in the last days? I've heard, you know, prophecy guys talk about the rapture of the church, the end times back in the 60s or 80s. You know, maybe you're old enough to remember those things. But you know what? The point is, um, it seems that things are getting even more heated up than ever. And if we're wrong, guess what? We're still right, I'll tell you why because the Lord wants his church to live with that expectation of his return. We're to be the faithful servant Jesus taught in Matthew 24 that's watching and waiting, ready for his return, not the wicked servant that's laying around, ah, the Lord of the lays is coming, he's not coming soon. And, and that, that, that's called the wicked servant in, in the narrative there of Matthew 24. So the good news is even if we're wrong, even if you know, the rapture of the church doesn't happen, and also the Bible tells us that these times we're living in, it's like um, you know, a, a woman that's in childbirth, labor pains, they come more frequently and more intense as the baby's coming. And that example is used over and over uh, in the Bible. So um, where are we gonna start tonight? Man, there's so much we could talk about and we'll just kind of play it by ear a little bit, but I do have a, a bit of a track that I'd like to take you on uh, to sort of walk through some of the stuff over the last month that we've been dealing with. And why don't you grab your Bible and uh, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter four. 1 Timothy four. And um, uh, this scripture um, is another Timothy scripture. Remember last time we looked at uh, 2 Timothy chapter three. And if you recall last, uh, what was it, June 5th, in our last prophecy update, we talked about in the last days, it says their perilous times will come. And then we went through the list of all those things. Well, in 1 Timothy, we have another sort of apocalyptic end times warning from Paul to young Timothy. Um, and it's here in 1 Timothy chapter four, and we'll take a look at verses one through six. Let's read it. It says there, 1 Timothy chapter four, verse one through six. It says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. So here we have this, um, this scripture given to us by Paul about the last days. And he says that the spirit speaketh expressly, let's back up a little bit on this first part of this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That means without any um, fogginess, uh, very clearly that in the latter times, that means the last days, the end, shall, shall, uh, some shall depart from the faith. Shall depart from the faith. 
Now, this, this is really going to jump back on what we studied last week when we were there in, uh, you know, um, Second Thessalonians, if you remember last month, I should say. We talked about the apostasia is the Greek word, the, the great apostasy or the great falling away. Um, and so there in our text here uh, tonight, it just says that in the last days, some shall depart from the faith. That's, that's the same thing, apostasy, where people will leave the true faith and follow after something else, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So the, the, the thing that we have to understand here, and maybe you can underline in your Bible that word sed seduction, um, because <laughs> the seduction is in fact the problem. Now, seduction is a term we often use in more sexual terms. But it's interesting because these demonic entities use a seductive sort of technique to get people to depart from faith and take up doctrines of devil. Now, now we Christians, we throw these words around and, and um, a lot of times we know what they mean. But if you're kind of new to the Bible, um, this, the idea of doctrine, the word doctrine, it means the teachings or um, instruction. Um, when we talk about Christian doctrine, it's what is true Christian teaching. But did you know that the devil has doctrine? It's also teachings of the devil. The devil wants you to learn his thing, his way, and he wants to teach. That's an interesting thing that the, 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 the devil wants to teach. And I think he's doing a great job in all of our colleges and universities teaching his doctrine. He's winning over people left and right. I, I say that sort of facetiously, but it's true. Man, if you're sending your kids off to universities and colleges, mom and dad, are you sure you really wanna send them? It's not education, it's indoctrination. And I'm believing that it's really a doctrine of devils largely. I'm not saying all college prof professors are bad. The math department's usually really great. <laughs> but, the, but the philosophy department or the, you know, uh, the literature or the uh, English and, and uh, some of the you know, uh, writing and psychology and sociology, man, there's a hostility. There's a teaching that's going on there that's so far from God's doctrine. And we wonder why our kids come out of the university more confused um, they were raised in the church, raised in the doctrine of the Bible, and how are they so quickly removed? Because the devil's got his doctrine, and he's using the, the, not only teaching doctrine, but he's doing it in a way of seduction. I think it echoes back to the Garden of Eden, you know, when the, the serpent, Lucifer there, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil seduced Eve. Now, now it's interesting because I've mentioned this before, but how did he seduce Eve? with things that a woman would be seduced by. Um, how did the enemy seduce the man? Well, he used the woman. <laughs> That's the way it happens, as it turns out. Um, here's, a, here's a woman who's there, who's gonna be tempted. So Satan says, listen, if you eat of this fruit, guess what? Your eyes will be opened and you'll be, you'll be enlightened and you'll become like God. Enlightenment? Becoming like God? Now, I have a theory. If he would have posed that seduction to Adam, Adam would have said, hm, whatever, and walked away. Because <laughs> most of the guys I know aren't really seduced by, ooh, enlightenment. Isn't it interesting that new age is largely run by women? Check it out. I know that this will make people mad, but I've been known to do that before. Um, and the thing is, um, it, you don't find a lot of men seeking enlightenment and getting into sort of having your eyes, finding your third eye of understanding and contemplating your navel. You don't see that very often, but women have a desire, and I believe it's a God-given desire, to go deeper in things spiritually. Men don't have that as much, I've noticed. So she was tempted by the serpent saying, hey, your eyes will be open, you'll be enlightened. How was Adam stumbled into sin? A naked woman. There she was standing there. Hey, you big boy, want a bite of the fruit? And he's like, yeah. And he goes and he's not lured by enlightenment. That's an interesting thing. And I think we see that carry on through all the ages of man where that's been a proclivity. Men aren't as deep spiritually. And that's why I think the Lord puts the man to be leading in the church. Why? Not because he's great necessarily at it, but because he, he needs to have the responsibility to keep him on track. 
men need to lead in the church because I think they just go and sit home and watch football if they weren't in leadership roles. Uh, it's interesting, the, the whole structure of the way God set it up, but, but interesting that these demonic entities in the last days, they're gonna turn up the heat when it comes to seduction. They're gonna seduce people. And I believe we're seeing that kind of seduction uh, right now. What are we being seduced to or away from? That's the question. In these last days, what will the doctrines of devils be teaching? Well, I believe number one, if you're jotting down notes, they're gonna be leading you and me away from sound doctrine. They're, the doctrine of devils will be leading to doctrine that is contrary to the doctrine of the Bible. And this is something that we need to be really careful of in these last days because there's all kinds of worldview and philosophy out there that is totally contrary to the Bible. And not only are people generally being sucked into the doctrines of devils, but churches. Churches have left good, solid Bible teaching and started getting into all kinds of weird thought. And it might sound esoteric and very intelligent, but man, you have to ask, is this in the scripture? Is what my pastor and, and, and what these leaders are talking about, are, are they in line with God's word? Or does it make me scratch my head and think, man, where did he get that? Uh, nice thoughts and intelligent and impressive presentation and nice, you know, uh, you know, stumping people with how smart the guy is, but is it doctrinally sound? And I believe that today there's a seduction and it's ever so subtle that's luring men and women away from good sound doctrine. Um, and not only that, number two, the seduction wants to lead you and I away from the, the church and the word of God. So if he can make you uh, sort of be listening to teaching in churches that's not sound, then eventually he'll try to lure you away from the church altogether and not really see the importance of the church. I see people minimizing the need to even go to church or be a part of a church because I think for a lot of decades now, our teaching has become so watered down and people say, well, I don't really need it. It's so empty and it doesn't really do much for me and I don't really feel fed or I don't feel like I'm getting anything. And the problem is we're, we're, we're feeding a bunch of cotton candy teaching with people with itchy ears, you know, so they just wanna hear what they wanna hear. And the Bible says, you know, the, the scriptures declare that in the last days, um, that there will be a famine in the land, not of food or drink, but of the hearing of the word of God. And these doctrines of devils, that's one of the things they're really into is luring the church away from the word of God and, and really ultimately being seduced. So what does this seduction you know, look like? By the way, la a couple weeks ago, I did a teaching from our Isaiah series. We're in the book of Isaiah right now. And um, if you didn't get it, it's called Hurry, Worry, Scurry. And um, it's from Isaiah chapter 30. We did it on the 21st of June. And uh, if you didn't catch that, I believe it gives a great description of what I was just trying to explain, how people are, the church is sort of sliding off the, the beaten path ever so subtly, and I believe it's largely what the end time says is gonna happen, is there's gonna be churches that are gonna depart from good, solid doctrine. So we, we went into that recently uh, in depth. So you say, okay, Brett, got it. Um, so what does that have to do um, with you know, Bible prophecy and all this stuff? Well, that's just it. The, the last days, one of the things we're, we're to watch for and not be deceived by is this seduction and this falling away. And what does the seduction look like? And, and what is, what is, what's the fruit of that seduction? And I believe that that's largely what we're seeing. If you could sort of quantify what I'm talking about is all the weird stuff that's going on right now. The stuff that makes you think, man, this isn't 2019. Doesn't 2019 seem so long ago when things were good? Uh, I remember December, we were talking about that at one of my prophecy updates in December. I said, you know, things are really, really good right now. And people might say, are we really near the end? Do you guys remember that? Because things are so good. And I said, but who knows, right around the corner, things can go totally crazy. I talked about that in December. Now, I'm not a prophet. Uh, there are no prophets today, by the way. Um, there's prophecy in the scriptures, but uh, the prophet, last prophet was John the Baptist, according to Jesus. You can study that yourself. But when it comes to prophecy, man, isn't it interesting that, you know, if you read your Bible, you can largely identify what's going on. And I believe that gives you great peace. 
even though things are haywire, even though things are crazy, if you kind of know what's going on and we know what to expect, it does help. So if you're one who's saying, Brett, these are scary times, I'd say, well, yeah, kind of, but we know how the end of the story is gonna work out. And we all live, guess what? Happily ever after. Christians, if you're a Christian. So that's why some of us prophecy guys probably seem a little weird, you know, when we get all excited about these things and people are saying, yeah, but that's horrible. That's horrible that, you know, Jerusalem's gonna be hanging by a thread and it's horrible that there's gonna be death and destruction in the world. Yeah, you're right. But at the same time, we're excited to see the Lord's plan unfold because he's righteous. And we know that everything he does is good and right. And every knee is gonna bow and every tongue is gonna confess that Jesus is the Lord. And we look forward to that day. We look forward to his coming. We, we look forward to the rapture of the church, man. I, I hope that's one of the things you start to really live, that anticipation of the rapture of the church. That it could happen at any moment. And I've said it a million times, there's no tr trouble I have, no problem I have today that wouldn't be solved by the rapture of the church. Everything would be solved for me uh, if the rapture happened right now, it could happen. But what does this have to do with Bible prophecy? Well, I believe the things we're seeing, the weird stuff. Um, when I say weird stuff, uh, the coronavirus, the way the government is handling the coronavirus, the social trouble and turmoil with racism and with Antifa, um, with Chop and Chaz in Seattle. I mean, we, we had a country come and go. If you didn't know the, if you don't watch the news, a country was birthed in America over the last month. And uh, it, it was, went for a while, the country of Chaz, you know, um, and they eventually changed it to the country of Chop. And there even was welcome to the, the nation of Chop, leaving the USA, entering Chop. And, and everything was, you know, kind of this weird taking over of six city blocks in, in Seattle, whole nother country. But then people started getting shot and lawlessness abounded, uh, which the Bible says in the last days, lawlessness. We talked about that last time. Um, and eventually, you know, the mayor was trying to put it like, oh, it's just a street party, but it wasn't. It was people take, being taken over and businesses shut down. And it was kind of this bizarre thing that we just, our government just let happen. But finally they had to go in with their, you know, SWAT teams and their, you know, so almost like, Armor, well, the armored vehicles, they had to go in there and just kind of take it, take back the police precinct and everything. And, and it's just weird. Who would have ever imagined that we would have just given over six blocks of one of our cities to craziness? Um, even if it is in the name of racism, which it very quickly showed that that wasn't the issue. Uh, that wasn't really the main reason why they were doing that. But what does this all have to do? You know, the, the, the chop and the coronavirus and the social unrest and rioting and Antifa and the economic possible pending doom. People are really nervous right now. Things are so great, but a lot of people believe it's the, the calm before the storm. You know, it's like Joseph's time, the seven years of plenty. And then he said, but you better be ready for the seven years of total famine. Some of us kind of believe that man, because of the way things are going, we almost feel like there's an agenda to tank the economy, especially before the election. In fact, you know, if you wanna be pretty cynical and, and stuff, you can kind of see that there seems to be a connection with all this unrest and the upcoming election. And it makes you kind of realize that people are willing to do just about anything, even to make our country, why, why in our country are they tearing, tearing down statues? I can understand maybe some of them, you know, some of the Confederate generals that were statues that were guys that were just fighting for the wrong side. And uh, history shows that they were on the wrong side. And I, I kind of get that. But when you're starting to tear down statues of Abraham Lincoln and stuff like that, I don't, I don't get that as much. Or, you know, there's some of these guys that were anti-slavery abolitionists. You know, um, well, Ulysses and Scrat, his family owned slaves. But if you, if you had any history at all, if you know, and even you know, elementary grade level, you, I've read the big thick biography on Ulysses S. S. Grant and he was anti-slavery his whole life. And um, he really fought against his family about slavery. Like he was, he was actively protesting back then um, about how the evils of slavery were not, not good. And, and, and yet nobody's, nobody's reading history. Nobody's really checking that stuff out. There's just other agendas and it seems like there's more to it. 
Have you noticed that? When you, when you start talking about racism and, and you talk to people and try to have legitimate conversation, it seems like there's more to it. And I'm here to tell you that it, there is more to it. It's a seduction, it's demonic, it's devilish. There's a, um, a, a plan and a, an agenda. Um, even as God has a plan and a purpose, Satan has a plan and a purpose, and he is trying to unfold that. And I believe he senses things are coming down. Any of you guys read, read the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? It's a great you know, allegory by C.S. Lewis. And it, it basically kind of tells the story of Jesus and his redemptive work on the cross. And if, if you've never read that, it's, it's, it's definitely worth a read, it's, especially with your kids, grade school age. But um, one of the things you'll remember, maybe if you remember the story is um, the white witch. She, was, she had control of Narnia and it was always winter, never Christmas, snow on the ground all the time, dark, gray, depressing. But when the kids go to the beaver's house, do you remember that, that thing where things are starting to thaw, like the snow starting to melt, which hadn't happened for decades. And they were starting to sense that something was changing. And, and then the beaver started telling the kids that the word on the street is that Aslan is on the move. And when they said Aslan, it's like everybody's, oh, Aslan. And Aslan's this lion that comes back to Narnia and is gonna make all the wrongs right and deal with the wicked witch and make it summer and springtime again. And it's this great story, but it's, it's almost like we're at that place where we're seeing things happen and it's dark and it's kind of gross and there's ugliness, but you almost sense that, man, there's something afoot. And I believe it's our Jesus, our Messiah, who's on the move and I think he's coming and I think his coming is soon. And so I think Satan is working overtime. And so you're seeing people hate each other. You're seeing people yell at each other in the streets and pulling guns on each other right now. Like, I don't know if you've noticed the last couple of days, there's been all these major conflicts in the streets of people. And you just think, what in the world's going on? What's happening? All the while, there's this weird agenda that nobody can figure out when it comes to the COVID thing. Should we wear face masks or not wear face masks? Trump's not gonna wear a face mask, it's a thing tonight. Meanwhile, Fauci's saying, yeah, you gotta wear face masks. But at first he said no face masks, but now he's saying, no, they really, no, they're not gonna, like, and everybody's just, what do you do? Now, if you don't wear a face mask here in Portland, you might get beat up. Like, it's really, uh, like, who did they put in charge of figuring out are face masks good or bad? Because they've not done a very good job explaining that to people. <laughs> Is it a good thing or, or a bad thing? And, and, then it, and then you wonder, like, as, as we live in, you know, um, or our church here building is in Clackamas County. And sad to say, they linked us up with Multnomah County and uh, Washington County. So the three of our counties, we're still in the dark ages of the draconian lockdown. Uh, I don't know if you know that. While, you know, other counties all around us are meeting in churches now, uh, even though it is 250 people, um, but churches are meeting, but not in our county. Uh, our governor is still under draconian lockdown and the control is, you know, there. And you they think, wait a minute, what's the deal? And, and, and you think, is there an agenda of power play as, as you know, people are protesting in the, in the streets for the last 30 days, 30 nights, and people are arm in arm and yelling and screaming, but as it turns out, you can't go to church. And if you go to church, there's articles out there. Have you seen the articles? Whatever you do, don't sing in church. They're, they're, they're basically telling churches you can't sing in church. Even if you have the six feet of social distancing in your church, you can't sing. And, and there's these weird rules, um, you, you know, where you can't walk in dry sand, but you can be in wet sand and on the beach. And where did all these crazy things come from? And what in the world's going on? I believe all of these things are part of what the enemy is involved with. That's why there's confusion. That's why there's strife. Remember the James 3 sieve you can run anything through? There's a reason this whole thing's going haywire and why no one really knows what to do and why people are frustrated and angry. It's because I believe the enemy um, is very much behind it. And, and the enemy has a plan and a purpose himself. And it, and it has to do with these things. Let me just quickly remind you of some of the things we talked about last time. The Bible says that the last days there's gonna be eventually in the tribulation period, seven years, that God's wrath is gonna be poured out upon a Christ-rejecting sinful world. There's gonna be a new world order. 
And that's something you're hearing these guys talk about all the time. Um, these governmental leads saying there's a new normal and there's new rules and we're never gonna go back to the way it was. And uh, that there's this new world order, I believe, is being defined as we speak. And the stage is being set for that to be really kicked into gear. Number two, a one world religion. In uh, Revelation 17 and Revelation 18, we read about those two things, the world religion and a world economic system, religious Babylon, economic Babylon. We've talked about that as far as Bible prophecy, but this is part of that new world order, but it's gonna be covered by a single new uh, world leader. He's sometimes called the Antichrist in the Bible. He's the son of perdition. He's the Assyrian. He's the man of sin. Uh, there's all kinds of names for this guy, but don't, don't be deceived. He's not gonna be some little devil looking guy running around in pink pajamas on a pitchfork. He's gonna be a very slick and loved and liked politician and military leader, and he's gonna make people follow them. They're gonna wanna follow him. Um, and so how is he gonna do this? You know, it's interesting because we talk about socialism a lot today. And, um, you know, if you're uh, somewhat of a student of socialism, you, you know its relationship to communism and Marxism. Um, and people don't really understand. You know, when they hear, uh, you know, people from my generation and older, we're all stunned because, see, we used to know that communism, socialism, well, that was about the worst thing on the earth. And the last thing in the world America would ever want to be is a bunch of socialists. And, um, and you, you hear that at the State of the Union addressed by Donald Trump when he said, you know, America will never be a socialist country. But as it turns out, um, people have been, this is one of the seductions, by the way. Let me just say it. It's a seduction. And I'm gonna say millennials particularly, um, maybe even some a little older than millennials, some Gen Xers, millennials, definitely Gen Z, they're being sort of seduced by socialism. Um, they, they've, they've, this is a generation, and I'm not trying to knock this generation, but it's our own fault. Uh, we Gen Xers and baby boomers, we let this happen in our universities and colleges where they started teaching this socialistic type view. I remember one of my college classes, um, the, the sociology professor the very first day said, I am a Marxist and I'm gonna spend my time in this uh, class. He, he didn't even try to hide it. I'm gonna try to convince you that Marxism is really the way to go. <laughs> and I heard him give his whole thing. And by the way, he said, the first thing is the church of, of, of you know, America is just a crutch. <laughs> That's how he started this class. And I thought, this is gonna be fun, uh, having that sociology professor uh, talk about that. And we, we battled it out for a term talking about Marxism versus Christianity and all this stuff. And, but people have been seduced by these, what I would say, demonic doctrines, doctrines of devils, seducing spirits that have basically um, kind, of, kind of put a, a whole generation at real peril. Um, you know, the, the people seduced by socialism have not likely had to sacrifice much for their own country. In fact, many of them have, have sacrificed nothing for their country. Uh, they seem to take it for granted, you know, the, the freedoms that they enjoy, even the freedom to believe in a political and economic system that is anti-freedom, um, that was dropped from the sky and were not achieved, you know, basically, you know, the ability to disagree and, and to protest, that freedom was dropped from the sky and we were not, a, and were not achieved really by hard, hard work, blood, sweat, and tears. Um, but they, they say, no, nope, that's just all right. They don't understand if they get what they want, Socialism, communism, Marxism, they won't have freedom to protest. They won't have freedom to do what they're doing. They don't get it. Um, all you gotta look at is Venezuela and all the other communism and socialism and Marxism that we've seen around the world. There's zero freedom. And the problem is we still have enough freedom in America where that generation doesn't know what socialism really looks like. But let me just tell you, socialism stifles incentive. It makes people totally dependent on government. You're not dependent on God. You're not dependent on the church. Those are crutches. You know, it's the opiate of the masses. Uh, it's, it's something that people just do to make themselves feel better. But the, the socialism basically, you know, it stifles incentives, make people, you know, dependent on government, um, not themselves. It, uh, I mean, it's, 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 um, it, it appears to be sort of a liberal idea. 
Um, but some people would rather just get a check than to actually earn a check. Um, and they'd, they'd feel just fine with that, uh, but have it all sort of equal across the boards. You know, look at all the TV ads, you know, advertising toll-free numbers, free shipping, other free incentives, uh, which are not free at all. The cost is simply added to the product that you purchase. And that's the thing. They appear to be good, free things, but socialism, there's nothing free about it. And it's a sedu seduction. And, and that's the thing. Nobody's talking about this, but, um, you know, and I'm not saying capitalism is the best. Any government, whether you're talking about democracy or if you're talking about a form of an economic system, you know, um, any of them can become evil apart from God. Any people group can become evil, no matter who you are. And I think we're seeing that largely in America. We, we lose our way as soon as we disconnect from God. But that's the thing, socialism and where the world is going right now is this seduction that First Timothy is trying to, you know, Paul's telling Timothy, that I think he's trying to tell us in the last days, people are gonna be seduced away from God, away from faith and away from the church. And we're seeing that happen right now, uh, in, right before our very eyes. Um, so so um, you say, okay, Brett, um, what, is this, what is this all about? Well, isn't it interesting that the, the, the scripture there in Timothy chapter four, verse two goes on and it says, they're doctrines of devils, but they're also speaking lies in hypocrisy. Do we see hypocrisy among the leaders of our nation right now? Um, that's almost laughable for me to even ask the question. If you follow politics at all, you see hypocrisy on all sides of the you know, the aisle. But, um, you know, it's funny how they used to say the church is full of hypocrites, but oh my, uh, they've brought hypocrisy to a whole new level. Uh, you know, I, I just I crack up. I mean, I, I, every day there's new stuff. Um, you know, like for example, Los Angeles Mayor uh, Eric Garcetti admits protests spreading COVID-19 gets ripped for double standard. And the reason he got ripped for having a double standard um, is because, um, he uh, was protesting with all the protesters and he was arm in arm and you know, went to his kneel, uh, knee, kneeling before Black Lives Matter. And um, so one minute he's saying he's gonna arrest people because they're going out on the beach uh, and getting some fresh air. Meanwhile, he's in groups like this, just all huddled up and not practicing safe social distancing. Um, Dr. Drew Pinsky called out Garcetti for this hypocrisy. Um, he said this, I'll, I'll, uh, Dr. Uh, Drew Pinsky said, I'll tell you one thing people cannot tolerate is hypocrisy or inconsistency, Pinsky said. Um, when they just, uh, w they will just not listen to you. And I think that's why we're getting some of the resistance to the thing we really need people to do, to distance, to wear a mask, to go about their life a little bit but they have been so inconsistent. And frankly, let's just call it what it is. They've been deceptive on this and unwilling to answer it. So here's Garletti standing in the middle of a crowd without his mask. And yet he sanctimoniously chides against uh, those who won't wear masks in public. It's really um, none, nothing but profound hypocrisy. Um, and we've seen this uh, in the powers that be in the social elites for decades. Um, I remember when Obama suggested that there's only so much a person can eat, and he's talking about too many wealthy people, implying that you know any more than a full stomach is too much within the United States. Um, he's telling the world that a person can have too much while he and his wife have a net worth of over $100 million, and they purchased a $15 million mansion in Martha's Vineyard. Um, how much is too much? Well, it's a hypocrisy. It's funny how, um, th there's, a, there's a politic that is required for these people to have their agenda, but they are unwilling to live it themselves. You know, they, they uh, won't allow people to protect themselves, but they build walls around their compounds, live in bubbles of security, but argue against, you know, the border wall and a person's right to protect themselves and their family. At the same time, they wanna defund the police. Do you see how hypocritical it is? So they've got enough money to have their own personal security detail, but they don't care about the rest of, of basically humanity. Um, uh, is, is this 
profound hypocrisy? Is this why they argue against the parent having the right to choose the best school for their child while the elites enroll their children in the best schools they can find? Man, you, you, you can check it out. The same people that are anti-homeschool, anti-letting people have school choice and the voucher system, um, they're the same people that pretty much pay off whatever they want to make sure their kids go to the school that they want them to go to. And meanwhile, the same group is acting like they actually care about people in poverty and the marginalized and the, those that have experienced racism, but they're really doing nothing about it, except for, you know, um, marching and, uh, and you know, showing signs of, of uh, care, but not in practice. Um, it claims to be based on tolerance. But the, these elites, they basically only tolerate those who agree with them. I remember, remember when tolerance was such a big thing? Diversity and tolerance. And we talked about it back then. And they chided against Christians saying, you guys are intolerant, which is really crazy because Christians actually are, we're, we're the, some of the most loving people. The, Jesus teaches us to love our enemies and do good to those who persecute us and hate us and despitefully use us. Like we're not only not supposed to tolerate, we're supposed to actually go above toleration and say, we actually love our enemies. <laughs> it's like, we were the ones saying, yeah, we're not gonna tolerate you. We're, we're gonna love you. That's what the church was saying. Meanwhile, the narrative of these same people who were arguing tolerance back in the 90s and the early 2000s, now um, they're, they're um, kind of dropping that narrative. And you know, and when they amass these huge fortunes and in the end they attempt to um, compel everybody and, and um, to, to do what they want them to do, but their policies are intolerant. The epitome of intolerance. It's kind of an amazing, amazing thing. Now you say, Brett, I, I've seen this and this isn't news, um, watching the hypocrisy the profound hypocrisy and seeing all this stuff. Um, and, and I see how they're trying to power grab and they're trying to come up with sort of a new system and they're, they're, they're forcing us to do stuff they never forced us to do before. The land of the free, the home of the brave. Man, this 4th of July is a little depressing because we feel like we've lost a lot of our freedoms. And, um, you know, um, unless, unless uh, you know, our governor starts to unlock this, uh, the last three counties, she's gonna have trouble because um, churches are gonna start meeting. Um, if you can't watch a bunch of people protesting and gathering on the 4th of July and doing everything. Meanwhile, the churches are dutifully saying, we're not gonna be a super spreader. See, that's the narrative. I, I guarantee you, if Athey Creek said, we're gonna suddenly start meeting again. And we, even if we practice perfect social distancing, you know, we've got a 45,000 square foot building here. Uh, we could fill it up with people and have six, we could put 10 feet between people and still have you know, 700 people here. This is a big building. But I guarantee the narrative, if we did that, they'd find somebody. We, there's a, I heard a person in our congregation um, sent me a, uh, a message of a, uh, of a guy that, that was a former um, staff member at a church in California. And um, it's kind of a funny story, but just long story short, he went in and he had a sniffles or whatever. And so they tested him for the COVID. And uh, then they said, you've got the COVID. And where have you been? And they listed, have you been to barbecues? Have you been to this and that? Have you been to churches? What have you? Well, he said, I've been to all those. And he said, well, which church did you go to? And they grilled him on the church. And it was almost like they fixated on the church so that they could go and figure out which church it was to basically call that church a super spreader. And they wanna, they wanna clamp down and put the nail in the coffin of the church, you know. And uh, California, you know, the churches, a bunch of churches, like 1,200 churches said, we're gonna meet. We don't care what's happening. Oregon's a little different than California, I would argue, uh, having lived in California and Oregon in my lifetime. Um, and uh, there's, there's some interesting dynamics here in Oregon that are conspicuous, uh, to say the least. But we're known to be weird and we're known to also be one of the most um, kind of crazy, uh, especially Multnomah County and the greater Portland area. We, we live in kind of a crazy uh, isolated area. That's why we moved here, by the way. Debbie and I pulled up stakes and moved to the Portland area because it's one of the most godless cities in America. That's why we moved here. It was a mission field to start a church in a place where God is 
not easily found. Churches, you know, at that time in 96, when we moved here, it was hard to find a good church. Now the Lord's doing a, a pretty cool work here in, in Portland and we need to see more. But with all this hypocrisy and with all this stuff and, and, and nobody's even pretending anymore. It's almost like the, the leaders and the powers that be are sort of chuckling as they're forcing everybody to wear masks and tell churches not to meet. And, and, and you see that these are sort of power grabs and you, you sense that, man, there's something sinister behind all this. And the answer is there, there is. Well, why, doesn't, why don't we do something about it? The answer is in our text. We will have what is called a seared conscience. That's what 1 Timothy chapter four Verse two says, it says this, it says, and having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When you sear something in your body, you start to, it, it hurts at first, but, but you, uh, you lose feeling. You're, you become sort of desensitized to those things. And I believe that's where we are. And that's why so much of the church, so many of the Christians are just silently watching as things pass by them and we're watching this world sort of go haywire and nobody's doing much about it. And people say, where's the silent majority? And the truth is throughout history, the silent majority has been meaningless. You know, um, um, uh, what's that gal's name? Gabrielle, uh, I forget her name, she's great. Uh, she's from Lebanon and she gives this great YouTube video where she's asked by a Muslim, you know, about why they don't talk more about Islamic. But she, 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 was, she basically went on this rant that was so true. And that is throughout history, the, the silent majority has proven to be meaningless. You know, um, where was the silent majority in Nazi Germany? when uh, Hitler was rising and they were starting to uh, get ready for the final solution and, and genocide a whole people group. Um, where was the silent majority? They were, they were insignificant. They didn't come into play. They were meaningless, they did nothing. And you could go on and on and talk about the silent majority. And so that's the problem today. Um, <clears throat> much of our culture, <clears throat> much of the church of Jesus Christ perhaps, sad to say, has allowed their conscience to be seared where there's no more sensitivity to what's going on. And we sit and listen to our, our sermons that really aren't sound doctrine in many churches. And we hear sermons about balancing your checkbook and making sure your marriage is good and how to raise kids and all this stuff, but we're not getting the full counsel of God. And we wonder why our conscience has become seared. Man, Paul warns Timothy, don't let your church get there. That's what this is all about. An old pastor reminding a young pastor of a very difficult church. He was the pastor, Timothy was, of the church at Ephesus. Brutal. And, and he said, watch out for these guys because they're gonna, they have an agenda. And your conscience has become seared where you don't even sense that there's stuff going on. And then Paul says, in the last days, in the latter times, what are they gonna do? Now, here's where the list gets crazy. And if you would have asked me 20 years ago, what does this mean? I would have said, I have no idea. Like, let's break it down just a little bit. What's the, one of the things that is gonna happen? Well, it says here in our text, 1 Timothy chapter four, they, uh, right what we read, one of the things they'll do is forbid people to marry. And I remember thinking, how is that gonna, who's gonna forbid people to marry? Well, now, did you know in Sweden, almost no one, there's almost zero weddings, almost zero. Did you know here in America, um, marriage rates in the United States is dropping exponentially? Um, you know, uh, this uh, article out of radio.com shows the rates uh, at an all time low in America because people are just not getting married anymore. And the controversy of gay marriage versus uh, heterosexual marriage and stuff, it's just people have lost the heart to be married at all. Um, and as it turns out, um, people are just living together. Or like Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, part of their statement of what they believe is to break down the nuclear family. That is to have a mom and a dad and a household with a mom and a dad with children. That's Marxism. And that's what they're into. Uh, read it, Black Lives Matter. You just go to their website and read what they're all about. You, you'll be stunned. And, and you'll maybe second guess, should we have been standing there saying, yeah, we're into Black Lives Matter, even though they're Marxist, anti-family, pro-LGBTQ. Why is the church standing with such an organization? The answer, seared conscience. 
giving in to seducing doctrines of devils. That's all it is. It's that simple. Brett, are you saying? Yep, I'm saying it. And I hope people are listening because we are living in days where we need to be good ministers, good pastors. Paul's gonna talk about that. Uh, he, said, he said, Timothy, you'll be a good pastor if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things. So marriage rate, rates are almost, well, they're dropping off radically. And I, I think there might come a day where people will say, forget marriage. Uh, we're gonna take away the institution. It's causing too much trouble. And people that have mar marriage rights and people who don't and all this stuff, it's becoming very convoluted. And if you'll notice, there's a, there's a great push in advertising and in our media and our news to really um, poke fun at marriage. The old you know, heterosexual husband and wife is sort of a dinosaur and laughed at, beaver cleaver and, her, and you know, the, the parents there is a joke today. So you watch it. As we get closer to the end, I think we're gonna see more and more of this where people are gonna say, yeah, we're not even gonna not encourage marriage, we're gonna forbid it. Um, that's, that's where it's going. Another one that's very terrorizing to me is the command to abstain from eating meats. <laughs> Let's go back and read that again. What does it say there? We just read it earlier tonight, but it says, it says they will command <clears throat> to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, which I do of them that believe and know the truth. For every creature is, uh, of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Isn't it interesting? Uh, you know, we used to joke 20 years ago about the vegetarians and people saying, you know, I'm vegan. And, and then and we joke about it as churches when people come and make a spiritual issue out of it. Well, if you really read the Bible, like the Westland Tidings, you know, there was an article a decade or so ago where this lady said, pastors in this local area need to care more for our brothers and sisters. And I'm like, wow, who's not being cared for? And the article went on how we marginalize them and we don't care about them, our brethren, the animals. <laughs> and the, the article went on about how as Christians, we have no right to murder our brothers and sisters, the cows, and the chickens. Um, and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a perspective <laughs> right there. Um, you know, and, and you're talking to a guy who thought PETA meant people eating tasty animals. I, I had no idea the level of craziness that this gets to. And they, they try to make this case that Jesus was a vegetarian, which man, we know he wasn't. He ate of the Passover meal, which included lamb. He ate of fish there on the seashore in Galilee. Like read your Bibles. Um, Jesus ate meat, and I believe he ate it with thanksgiving. Um, and, and so you say, Brett, well, what does that have to do with the last days? Well, do you, do you believe it? People are trying to make the case for veganism um, today, and I believe, I believe they're gonna start making it even more of a thing. Uh, did you hear what Cory Booker said? Uh, vegan is what he's called. Uh, says meat eating will destroy the planet. Um, this is what he said. Um, the tragic reality is this planet simply can't sustain billions of people consuming industrial produced animal agriculture because of environmental impact. Um, that's what Cory Booker had to say. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, she gave a big speech about urging kids to save the planet by you know, ditching meat and dairy. And then like the next day, she and her friends are eating hamburgers or hot dogs in, the, in her car and she's videotaping it. Like that's that um, hyper hypocrisy that we were talking about before. She, she's really good at that part of it. But she's one of the people who are making this argument. Um, she does this whole thing about how because of the flatulence of so many cows, it's destroying the earth. And so you, can't, you, you shouldn't have a steak or a hamburger because all these cows are you know, um, flatulating and uh, breaking down our, uh, our planet. <laughs> um, man, uh, just look it up. I'm not making this stuff up. But where are we going with this? We're starting to see where Paul says they're gonna forbid people to marry. They're gonna tell people that they're supposed to abstain from eating meat. We're there. We're seeing little detail. Now we're getting into the detail painting. You know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, I could do a Bible prophecy update and we could paint with a broad brush and say, look at the mark of the beast as possible. Look at, look at all these other things. Look at Israel and the nations and all that. We could paint with a broad brush. We can get in there and just paint with such detail now of every little detail 
I'm going through some detailed stuff here, not eating meat, not marriage, you know, all this, this uh, hyper, uh, you know, uh, hypocritical sort of behavior. So you say, Brett, what in the world then is going on? All this stuff and these agendas, uh, um, what in the world's going on? Well, I believe this all has to do um, with, with, you know, that we've seen how this new world order will be put into action. Um, you see, to understand the new world order and where it's going, it might do us well to look backward because there, there are, there's been evidence, and I could, I could talk about this all night, evidence of people who saw it coming and knew about it, the way it was gonna unfold. There's books that have been written um, that uh, talk about how there was a plan to get to where we are today, where they could take and power grab and get ready for a one world government, a one world religion, a one, a one world leader, a one world economic system, can't buy or sell without a mark of the beast. All of this stuff is poised and postured. And there's been people talking about this that aren't even Christians for a long time now. Um, let me show you something that came out in 2010. Let's go backward in history. So like 10 years ago, um, there's, a, there's a PDF file. You can look this up. You can Google it if you want to. Scenarios um, there for the future of technology and international development. And there's a whole thing here and they run through these scenarios of how the world will respond and react to various conditions and how the, how the Rockefeller Foundation, who puts this on, if, if you'll notice there, the, they're almost always, whoops, let me go backwards. Um, they, they almost always uh, sort of, you know, there's a Rockefeller Foundation there at the bottom uh, and very much funded by Bill Gates, by the way, but the scenarios for the future technology of international development. Um, this, is, this is like the early stages 10 years ago but when I read this part of this article, this is a multi-paged report. And these scenarios, um, in, on page 18 of this document, um, there's a section about lockstep is what they call it. And, um, and, and they, they talk about a, a scenario, but you have to understand, they're talking about a scenario that could happen in the future, but they act like it's in the past tense. Are you with me? So when I read this, they're, they're gonna treat it like it's already happened and here's what we see is gonna happen and here's what we need to be doing and be thinking about for this scenario. This is like a think tank of how they're gonna handle things in the future. Um, uh, the title of this little lockstep is a uh, long title, a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback, okay? So what are, what are they gonna do? So remember, this is written in past tense like it already happened. Here's their scenario. In 2012, the pandemic that the world, remember this is written in 2010, so they're acting like this would happen in 2012. In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's, you know, H1N1, this new influenza strain originating from wild geese was extremely virulent and deadly. When the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed, when the virus streaked around the world, infecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just seven months. The majority of them, healthy young adults, the pandemic also had a deadly effect on the economies international mobility of people and the goods screeched to a halt. Debilitating industries like tourism, breaking global supply chains, even locally normally bustling shops and office buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet. Um, though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency, accelerating the spread of the virus, not just within the United States, but across borders. Do you hear what they're saying? We, we were gonna be lenient and let Americans fly, but being lenient ended, ended up, of course, backfiring on us. Have you seen that? This narrative is exactly what we're doing. You know, as soon as they open up something, they'll say, oh, see, look at, now we have COVID. We've got a super spreader over here. Got to shut that down and clamp down even harder now. 
That's what they're doing. Exactly what they're saying here. Um, they, however, a few countries did fare better. China in particular. The Chinese government's quick in, uh, imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, because of course they can do that, they're communists. Um, they just clamp down, as well as its instant and near uh, hermetic seating, uh, sealing, pardon me, off of all borders. It saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of virus far earlier than other countries and enabling a swifter post-pandemic recovery. Scenarios for the future of technology and international development. China's government was not only the one that took the extreme measures to pr protect its citizens from risk and exposure during the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions from the mandatory wearing of face masks to the body temperature checks at the entries of communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified in order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems. Um, from pandemics and transformational terrorism, pardon me, transnational terrorism to environmental crisis and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. At first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and for greater stability. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight, and national leaders had more latitude to impose order in the ways they saw fit. In developed countries, this heightened oversight took many forms, biometric IDs for all their citizens. That'd be like a mark of the beast kind of thing. Um, biometric IDs, for example, and tighter regulation of key industries whose stability was deemed vital to national interests in many developed countries enforced cooperation with a suite of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily restored both order and importantly, economic growth. Sorry to read such a long deal there, but this was written 10 years ago, basically saying what we need is a good crisis and you never want to let a good crisis go to waste. And what are you gonna do with it? More power. We're gonna become one world and come with one plan. We're gonna save humanity from itself. And we're gonna give you a mark, uh, a, a biochip identity. And we're gonna make sure you're controlled and save you from your own stupid self. You see, man, when you break this little dissertation down, the, the Rockefeller Center, uh, you kind of realize, well, this wasn't just, this is why some people are calling this the plandemic, <laughs> not a pandemic, a plandemic, because there's, there's actually a lot of these kinds of articles. I've already read to you uh, some of the other scenarios in previous prophecy updates of different organizations, Rockefeller Center and or Rock, Rockefeller Foundation and Bill Gates seems to be kind of at the center of a lot of these, which is odd. Um, I, I'm as qualified as, as Bill Gates to be a doctor talking about wearing masks. I don't see why he's the guy telling everybody this, but he's, he's kind of in the middle of that. What, what is the, the deal? Now, Here's something to, as a Bible prophecy buff you, you might wanna consider. When we ask the question, where is America in the future Bible prophecy scenarios? It's amazingly absent. That's, that's one of the things we've scratched our heads for years about, you know, thinking, man, you hear all about China, Russia, Israel, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, like all the, the nations, you know, um, you, you read about them, but the most powerful nation in the world, the United States, is strikingly absent from the biblical narrative of future events. Why? And the question is how? And I wonder if what we are seeing happen and the weirdness that we're feeling is this imposition of the world reaching into the United States and our freedoms. And are there other agencies and people groups controlling the powers that be here in America to sort of move us away from church, move us away from God. We're, we're still one of those holdout nations. Even though, even though we're becoming more godless like we talked about last Sunday, we still have a lot of people hanging on to their Bibles and going to church. 
and the world looks down their nose like we've talked about, you know, that's baby stuff, you Christians in America, you're the problem. But we're seeing this whole sort of attack on the Christian worldview and our freedoms, even being able to go to church and attend church and sing worship songs. Like they're, they're, they're hammering away at some of these things. So this idea of where is America in, in Bible prophecy? And the answer is it's not there. And I wonder if, if, if the reason America is not in Bible prophecy is because it's not there practically. Could it be that we are so powerless by the time the tribulation comes around, the rapture, the, or by, it's gotta be by the end of the tribulation, America is a non-factor. And so there's several theories. Maybe the rapture of the church disables America. I, I hope so. I hope there's enough Christians here in America that when the rapture happens, that a lot of our military will be gone, our law enforcement will be gone if they're not defunded first. Uh, but I do believe a lot of our law enforcement, a lot of our military, even, uh, We'll, we'll probably have a lot of people still in Washington, D.C., but, but a lot of America will be sort of gutted by the rapture. That's one thing. But another thing is, like Obama said when he was the president, we're no longer a Christian nation. And I, I see the, the, all the weirdness that we're seeing right now, the seducing doctrines of devils, it's, it's corroding America from the inside out. We're imploding and unless something radical changes, I don't see a real happy future for America. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. How do we get away from what we're seeing happening right now? Some people say, well, once the election's over, suddenly the coronavirus will disappear and suddenly the racism issue won't, won't be at the forefront again and we'll be back to normal. Some people are saying that. But there's a lot of people are saying, man, where do we go from here? Um, there's hatred and there's, um, you, know, you know when Jesus was asked in Matthew 24, where he, they said, tell us about the end of the world. And remember when Jesus said there was wars and rumors of war, earthquakes in diverse places, but he says, nation shall rise against nation. There's a word there that you should look up in the Greek because it's an interesting word. The word for nation in that passage of Matthew 24 in the Greek original text, ethnos. Ethnos will rise against ethnos. It's not as much country against country. It's ethnicity against ethnicity. That's what Jesus said. You can check it out, but it's the word ethnos, which is ethnic, where we get our word ethnic. So the absence of America, could it be that we're watching America weaken from the inside out? And it's heartbreaking, it is. As a, a patriot, as, a, as the 4th of July this weekend, you know, is coming our way, you kind of want to say, man, God bless the USA. But sometimes you have to say, can we even really say that? Because, man, our behavior is not blessed worthy in a lot of ways. Now, I believe this is actually not just accidentally happening. I think Satan's been hard at work using all kinds of various powers and demonic issues and entities and influencing other nations to come against us. I've got a video I'd like to show you of um, a guy, we, I told you we'd go backward. I showed you 10 years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation. Let's go way back to 1984. Um, in 1984, Yuri Alexandrovich uh, Bezmenov, um, he, uh, he was a um, known, known by the alias Thomas David uh, Schumann. Uh, he was a Soviet journalist and former KGB agent. So he, he was a KGB guy, but a, a journalist. But um, he was the guy who uh, was in charge or worked with basically psychological warfare. And um, he was, he eventually defected. Um, he, he became sort of resentful about the, the way the KGB did stuff and sanctioned repression you know, of intellectuals who dissented from Moscow's policy. So he actually defected to Canada. Um, and in 1984, he st when I graduated from high school, he started talking about their tactics. What were, the, what were the Soviets doing back then to sort of beat the United States from the inside out? I'd like to roll a, sh a little four or five minute video for you of this guy explaining their tactics. And you need to listen carefully. I know he's speaking in a little bit of a Russian accent, but you can turn up the TV if you have to. Uh, but let, let's roll this, uh, this video. I wanna show you what they were doing back in 1984. 
But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of its intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money, and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. You cannot change their mind, even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in, in future Marxist-Leninist America. Uh, here you can, you can get uh, popular like uh, Daniel Ellsberg and filthy rich like Jane Fonda for being dissident, for criticizing your Pentagon. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. But what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure, and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media, and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. United States is in a state of war, undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. The, the time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. This is it. This is the last country of freedom and, and possibility. Huh. Interesting guy um, and a lot of interesting things to say. Um, but there was this activity going on back in 1984. 
And, um, and I could show you all kinds of things that are kind of behind the scenes and people pulling the levers, um, the powers that be. And not to get overly conspiratorial, but I just wanna say that none of this that we're seeing should be a shock to us. People like this, this guy spent the last years of his life, and by the way, shortly after this, he had a, a massive heart attack and died. Uh, you kind of wonder the way the Soviet did things back then. And, and even still today, you wonder if he was offed because he was giving trade secrets out uh, at this time in the 1980s. But all that to say, you know, we're watching these guys who've been saying this stuff for years and these organizations, the Rockefeller Foundation and the others who are saying, this is what we wanna do, this is where we wanna get to. And, and all you need is a crisis to uh, jump on board and really change things. And that's what's happening right now. The world is changing. And um, they think it's gonna be changing in the way they want it to come. I believe that the world is changing and the stage is being set, set up for Christ's return. The one world religion, one world economic system, one world government, one world leader, all of this is postured by what's happening in the world today. And, and uh, something to keep your eye on, something to, to note. Now, he said there was only one country left to defect to, and that's America, which uh, I would say that. But you know, if I had to defect to another country, you know, one of the safer countries to be in right now is Israel. <laughs> uh, isn't, that, isn't that something? Uh, and before we go, and I know the hour's getting late. I, as I was watching the video, I realized, wow, what happened to the time? But I wanna share with you, because Israel and the United States, we're the two countries that are sort of together. We're standing with Israel, especially under this uh, presidency of Donald Trump. He's been the best friend to Israel uh, that, that, um, that Israel's ever had from America. And um, meanwhile, you know, I, back at the epicenter, Jerusalem is the epicenter of all Bible prophecy. Israel is God's timepiece. And I wanna share with you, there's, there's amazing things going on. While we're focusing on Black Lives Matter and the COVID-19 and, and uh, the economy and all the stuff that's going on, meanwhile, the Middle East and the epicenter of Bible prophecy, there's all kinds of stuff going on. But it's going somewhat unnoticed by the world. And I, I say unnoticed, that's probably a bad description. It's being sort of put off. Um, put off for what? Well, let, I'll explain that in a second. Um, what's going on with Israel? Did you know that as of July 1st, it was supposed to be the first, but whether it's happened or not, it's still kind of up in the air. But one of the things that's happening in Israel right now is the annexation uh, of the Jordan Valley. Now, if you've been to Israel with me, when we were driving down by the Dead Sea and, and floating in the Dead Sea, you know, that salty sea and down there, when we were looking out from Mount Nebo when we were in Jordan, looking down to the, the, the massive cliffs down to Israel and seeing the Dead Sea and seeing the city of Jericho, that's the Jordan Valley. Um, and it's been a hot point of contention. Now, I, I don't have time to go into all the history, and we've done this in other studies, but you know, the, the Balfour Declaration was, was um, sort of the pre-Israel being a nation agreement of who gets what land. And that's the only last real agreed upon document of giving land. The Jews actually had the Jordan Valley in that giving uh, of the land by the world. Um, and you can look up, by the way, if, um, if you wanna read a, a great informative book on this history of the land of Israel, who, who the land belongs to, how it all was broken up. Uh, there's a book called uh, From Time Im Immemorial. Uh, Immemorial, From Time Immemorial. It's a great book. Um, and it just goes through all this. But basically, um, you know, Israel uh, was able to uh, start looking uh, as, as the Zionist movement. They started looking at this land saying, we gotta go back to our homeland. Now, what I want you to see in this map here is um, be after Israel became a nation, um, they were attacked by five Arab nations. And the land that you see um, here um, is, is uh, it looks like a dagger. The Arabs think of this dagger of this picture 
uh, they think it's the dagger that divides the Arab world. But if you look closely, um, that light yellow section is what is called by the enemies of Israel, the occupied territories. And as we zoom into that, you see the West Bank, that light yellow bigger chunk is called the West Bank. The little light yellow chunk in the left is, the, um, is Gaza Strip. That's a whole nother story. But right now, Netanyahu is claiming the, the eastern border of Israel and it's called the Jordan Valley and they're annexing it. Now, um, this has caused eyebrows to raise and that he's gonna annex this whole section where it's orange here. And this annexing of this section, um, you know, people, people say, well, nobody ever annexes. Like the Russians annex part of Ukraine. Like people, countries usually get into big trouble when they start annexing other people's countries. But the truth is the Palestinians are not a nation, nor are they a country. Um, that's the, the interesting thing. They're, they're a people group um, and they're kind of pawns that are between the Arabs and the Israelis. But there is no real Palestine. Um, and we can talk about that. That's controversial, I know. Uh, we've, we've done whole studies on that. But what Netanyahu is doing right now is basically saying, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna annex that orange section for Israel. And the, world, the whole world is upset. In fact, um, if, if you look at the Jerusalem Post today, uh, there's an article, 10 things to know about the West Bank annexation. Um, and, um, you know, um, it's basically uh, for the first time in modern Israel, for the past 40 years, they will have, um, they'll be making a, an Israeli sovereign Eastern border. Now, as far as security and militarily, the, strategy, uh, the strategic value of that is unspeakable. They have not had a great border between Jordan and Israel. And you say, well, isn't Jordan friends with Israel? Kind of. But do you understand, they're worried in Jordan about an Arab Spring. You know, the Palestinians tried to take over Jordan back when Yasser Arafat was in charge. Remember when they uh, snuck him out, uh, dressed as a woman, that whole thing, uh, because of this whole thing. But that's a whole other issue. But the Palestinians and, and the Arab Spring that has happened in other places like Egypt and uh, Libya and these other places, they're worried about that happening uh, in, in Jordan. But that, that border of Jordan and Israel would be a horrible challenge for the Jews if the Arab Spring were to happen. Now, ISIS and other people have been found in Jordan and there's an agenda that, that's quite stressful there. So that's one of the things that the Jews have wanted is to make uh, that Eastern border, border annexed into, um, into uh, Israeli power. So the Jerusalem Post article says, almost everyone in the international community is opposed to annexation. This includes the Palestinian Authority, Israel's Arab neighbors, and most of the other nations, as well as international entities, such as the United Nations, I call them the United Nothings, um, and the European Union. The in international community holds that Israel does not have the right to unilaterally change its sovereign borders. It believes that the Jewish state can only do so as part of a final status agreement toward a two-state resolution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. In addition, the international community holds that the West Bank is territory des designated to be part of a Palestinian state and that Israel's presence there, including its settlement activity, is illegal under international law and possibly constitutes a war crime. Scores of UN resolutions uphold that viewpoint. The UN in particular holds that nations cannot acquire territory through conquest, even in a defensive war. Now, what happened? That region, let me back up back to that map. That region, um, you have to understand, Israel back, uh, if, you, if you recall, in 1948, they had all that orange and yellow space, but then they were attacked by Arab nations and they lost that section, uh, the light yellow section to Jordan. And so that was a Jordanian territory for a while. You might call them occupiers. <laughs> I say that because it's funny how they turned it around to make the Jews occupiers. Now in 67, if you remember the war in Israel there in 67, the Jews recaptured the West Bank, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and they sort of control that area. And the world says, well, it's Palestinian territory, but the Jews are like, no, it's kind of ours. And the world's saying, no, it's kind of the Palestinians. Um, but largely it's under Israeli control 
But by annexing it, they can secure their Eastern border. Now their whole border is gonna be secured by Israel, which is strategically important for the nation. But more than that, the annexing of Israel is not doing anything to the people that live there. The people that live there are like, yeah, whatever. Nothing's gonna change for them. Uh, Jew or Palestinian, it's not gonna change. Um, And everybody knows that. Uh, But the world is just wanting to make a stink. But interestingly, why is suddenly Israel so bold to make this move now? We'll talk about that in a second. Um, So you've got um, next up on the list of things that Israel's doing. Have you heard about the Natanz nuclear facility in Iran? Uh, as it turns out, there's been some mysterious, uh, mysterious uh, explosions um, and people are wondering what in the world's going on. The incident is the third mysterious explosion in a week. There was another one uh, yesterday um, that is blowing up these nuclear facilities in Iran. The plot thickened on Thursday afternoon, hours before a building at a nuclear facility looked to have blown up in Iran. Reports of an explosive device planted and an early warning as well as a dissident group uh, talk, uh, that was taking responsibility now adds questions and concerns about what actually is happening. Um, and so this, this nuclear site, you'll see pictures of it on the news and stuff. Why is it being blown up? Well, most people understand that the Jews are not letting the Iranians get a nuclear weapon. I've told you this in other prophecy updates, but the Jews cannot afford to let the Iranians, who wanna blow them off the map, they, they, don't, they don't even try to hide the fact. They wanna wipe Israel out. So Israel's like, yeah, we're not gonna let Iran have nuclear capabilities. And so when they start gaining uh, access to uh, enriched uranium and all this, the Jews, uh, probably some covert uh, Mossad agent is over there doing something. But um, it's really funny when you watch the news, the Iranians don't wanna admit that the Jews have been successful in this. So they're acting like we're, somebody's, some organization is hurting us, but they're not, they don't wanna admit it's the Jews. It's, it's actually kind of a funny thing. So, so you say, Brett, with all that going on, the annexation of the Jordan Valley with the bombing of these uh, places in Iran, why is there peace in Israel? Why aren't the Arab nations freaking out like they used to or like they always do? The answer is interesting. It has to do with Trump and Netanyahu. They're, they're guys that are kind of on the same page. They, they came up together with the peace, what do they call it, the deal of a lifetime uh, that the Palestinians don't want any part of it. But they're, they're saying, hey, we came up with a great plan and the, they knew that the Arabs would reject it. But right now with Trump in the White House and with Netanyahu there in Jerusalem, you, you've got this sort of powerful joining. And so the Jerusalem Post just came out with an article a couple of days ago saying, everybody just hang on, wait till the election. Cause Netanyahu's on his way out. Trump they're hoping is on his way out because uh, they're not gonna do anything. All the Arab nations are sort of waiting and they're being implored by each other, wait, don't do anything to Israel yet. Meanwhile, up in Syria, Iran, Turkey, Erdogan's up to his shenaniganry. Um, you've got uh, you know, Assad up in Syria and Lebanon and Hezbollah. Everybody's sort of posturing themselves, hoping that when Netanyahu leaves, when Trump's gone, that they can start doing what they wanna do with, with Israel. Israel is living in real safety right now, but they're all kind of worried what's gonna happen after Trump's gone, after Netanyahu's gone. Um, and so people are kind of freaked out right now. You say, okay, Brett, so what's the deal with that? Well, that just shows us again. And, I, I, and maybe in our next time, we'll talk more about Israel because it is the epicenter of Bible prophecy. I keep saying that, but there's so much going on locally here. There's a lot to talk about. But what do you and I do with this? You see, the world thinks that Israel's not being attacked because Trump and Netanyahu, but I don't believe that. I believed Israel's not being attacked right now because there's something else holding back all this. We're seeing craziness happen, but I wanna end with this. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, verse 7, um, 7 through 11, it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth now already work, only now he who letteth, and that means holds back, like when you serve a, remember you, you serve a tennis ball and it let, it, when it hits the net? There's something letting, holding back. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Is that Netanyahu? No. Is it Trump? No. Is, who's the he there? 
it's kind of a, a, a thing where it's he, the Holy Spirit, as he works in and through the church of Jesus Christ. What's this? Only he who now holds back, there's something holding back this whole thing. And I believe it's the church and the Holy Spirit in the church. It says, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. That's the rapture of the church. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders with all deceivableness and unrighteousnesses or unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Remember we started tonight talking about the seduction and the, the deception that's happening right now. And there are people who are saying, I reject God. And what's God gonna do? At the end, he's gonna send them even greater deception. See, Christians, this answers a lot of questions right now when you say, I can't believe people think this way. How is it that people are so blind to what's really going on? And the answer, there's a strong delusion and there's a seductive satanic deception that's going on. And once they get to a certain point, God says, okay, I'm done with them. And he's gonna send them even a stronger delusion and the deal's gonna be sealed completely. Well, then what are we supposed to do, Brett? Well, right after this, in 2 Thessalonians chapter two, talking about this kind of scary stuff, believing the lie, strong delusion, all this, he ends the discussion in chapter two, um, verse 15. This is where we'll end tonight. Therefore, brethren, what are we supposed to do? Stand fast. Hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. Comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word and work. There's your marching orders, folks, right there. <laughs> That's it. You know um, how important it is for us to, to uh, make that our goal. Should we get guns and defend ourselves like that one pastor who had the dreams? Is that what we're supposed to do? It's not what the Bible tells us to do. Um, the Bible says, what are you supposed to do? Stand fast. And, and then it says, it gives us even greater, you know, it says, stand fast, hold the traditions which you've been taught, the teachings that you've been given. See, that's one of the things, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. And I'm concerned a lot of the younger pastors, now I'm sounding like an old guy, but a lot of the younger pastors I hear, there's this, there's this burning desire to come up with something new something fresh, something innovative. The problem is you have to kind of twist scripture to sort of fit your new idea. And if you twist scripture, you ended up with twisted scripture <laughs> and that's gonna kill you. Um, that's gonna hurt the church. We need people to go to the old traditions of teaching doctrine, old school Bible study. We need to go with scripture, hold fast to the traditions it says there which you have been taught, whether by word or by epistle. Now Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, which has loved us, hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. And then I love what he ends on, comfort your hearts, establish you in every good word, things you're saying, and in every good work, things you're doing. Rather than being fearful and freaked out uh, during these days where we see the end times, they seem to be unfolding right before our eyes, we should be established in a good word and good work. Instead of going around speaking about the things that are all doom and gloom, go around and give a good word about God's grace and how he saves us from our sins and Jesus died on the cross. That should be our message, church. Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul said, I have determined to know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Every good word and every good work, looking for ways to serve and, and to do good work in these last days, there are the marching orders. And so that's your, net, your next installment of Prophecy Update. We'll hit it on the next first Friday of August. So uh, looking forward to that. We're, I feel like I, we only scratched the surfaces, but sorry we went so long tonight, but there's much to talk about. And, uh, and man, let's just keep be praying. Let's be light and salt in this dark world. In Jesus' name, let's pray. And Lord, we are so thankful for your word. Lord, that we are children of the light. We're not children of the night in the darkness, being caught as a thief in the night, 
but instead, Lord, you, you, you shine your light of your word and, and it gives us all the answers. I love that we can see the things that are happening and we can make sense of them, Lord, as Christians, because your word tells us the way it's gonna roll out. So give us faith, Lord. I pray that we'd not be given over to a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of a sound mind. Lord, help us to have the hope of heaven. Help us to be more heavenly minded, thinking of those things that are coming. Lord, I pray that we'd be watching and ready, waiting for your return. In Jesus' name, amen.